All right, guys, let's do this. All right, cool. Um, market week today, uh, spies down 1.8%. It's really not that big. Uh, it's big, but it's not that big compared to what we're experiencing in the down move. I mean, how many days in the way down? I, I in my entire career, have never seen the market go limit down until late February, early March. And we saw it happen like four times where the market's down, what is it, 7%, 7.5%, something like that. And they halt the market for 15 minutes. I, I had never seen that happen until uh, earlier. So um, earlier, you know, late February and in, in, into March. So being down a percent and a half or whatever I just said, 1.8% is not massive, but it felt like a victory for the Bears today. That's for sure. Uh, Q's, let's take a look here. Q's down 1.2%. Um, you know, I really do like to pay attention to that gamma stuff that Pat talks about because that's when you'll know um, when, when that gamma flips to negative is when volatility picks up. I think it should be flipping to negative somewhere around here. So at some point soon, hopefully Pat has a more concrete update for us on that. But um, we got below these moving averages here on the daily chart of the spies. Let me take a closer look at the Qs. So focus on the spies recently. Yeah, Qs still look healthy as all hell, to be honest. Still within their ascending channel, their uptrend here, higher highs and higher lows. All they have done is pull back into the equilibrium area and then pivoted a little bit and closed off their lows. Qs still look healthy. Spies do not look as healthy. Broke their moving averages really for the first time to the downside on the way up. I don't overly read into that. Um, you know, we haven't broken from a, an uptrend to a downtrend really yet at this point. Uh, well, did we? Yeah, actually, you could say that we did, right? Because here is the last higher high. Here was the last higher low. Here's a little bit of a lower high. That's literally just from yesterday. And then today we got a little bit of a lower low. So you can say that the uh, uptrend in the spies is broken. I wouldn't necessarily call it a downtrend yet, and I wouldn't necessarily say it's confirmed yet, because even though we ticked below this low, we didn't close below it, and um, uh, yeah, I mean we didn't close below support. You know, we basically held that area. Uh, what today's low? Yeah, we did break two seventy nine by a few cents. So I, I've been broadly looking at this area of support as the area between the 21 EMA and this pivot, which was 279.13. So we did clear all that by a little bit, but I wouldn't say it's totally confirmed yet. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. It's two big down days in a row. Um, we could get a third, but I think it's more likely that maybe we get a rest day here. And uh, we'll see how, how that kind of pans out tomorrow. I'm really not 100% sure. Uh, but on, on today's intraday price action, we called it really well, um, I think. Uh, you know, I kind of came onto the VTF this morning and, you know, basically stated that I was as like as bearish as I've been in a while. And I was really planning on laying the risk on today for the first time. And, uh, you know, I kept talking about how I was trying to combine being aggressive and patient at the same time. Um, aggressive in attacking, because I really felt that this morning, the flattish open to up open. I mean, when I, when I was shorting stuff this morning, it was pre-market and the market was up at that point. I really felt that like that was a gift. I was really surprised that we weren't gapping down because the, the price action we had gotten down to 283 or so after hours yesterday. Uh, let me bring that up just so you guys can see yeah, This is how we closed at 8 PM at 283. And then um, you know, our, our actual closing price is somewhere here. And then this morning pre-market, I'm looking at us green and I was like really surprised, but there was no real news that was bringing us up there that I could see. So I kind of just viewed it as a gift and laid into my shorts and it worked out really well. Um, so I was right on the down move. I, I struggled a little bit in here with the market just because you know, we sold off a little bit pre-market to open a little bit negative. We had this initial momentum move, fine. We had this little five-minute hammer candlestick. What what does this candle mean? This candle means correction, technical correction through price or time. Usually the shape of this candle means price, especially when it's confirmed by volume. And uh, the second bar of the day, 
actually has higher volume than the first bar of the day. That's pretty rare. The first bar of the day, usually, you know, you look at almost any trading session, the first bar and the last bar are going to have the most volume. And the main reason for that is because it's within the first and last bar that all of the opening and closing uh, imbalances get settled. So it naturally creates a, a lot of volume on those bars. So whenever you can have candles that are higher than that bar, it's always something to take notice of. So you had a five-minute extension hammer on confirming volume on this chart. This is actually for guys that are really shorter term, you know, you're, you're a scalper trader or whatever, what have you. If you'd like to learn more about prop trading, click the link in the video description. This is actually a great short-term long signal. I teach this trade, you know, when I do like that candlestick class. This is a great buy setup here. But what does it mean? Again, it means that you should expect a price correction to equilibrium. What is equilibrium? It's the space between the 8 and 21 EMA. That's how I view it. So it could just go directly to the 8. It could go through it. It could go to the 21. It could even pierce the 21 and then go lower, which is eventually exactly what happened. Um so when I saw that happen, it's like, okay, extension, price corrections coming. But I thought that this could be the pivot right here, that this market might be so weak today that we don't even get a full price correction off of this candle all the way back to the ADMA. Maybe we just bounce to here, pivot, and then, and then immediately go lower, and this is like a bear flag. This ADMA catches up a little bit, and, and it goes. Not what happened. We moved up higher again. We got into this equilibrium area. And it's like, okay, uh, you know, if I wanted to be really aggressive and the market was going to be really aggressive and bearish, it probably could have gone already. But this is what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to get back in this area and then pivot. And then it kind of gave you this little five-minute candle here. Okay, maybe that's the pivot. So I'm like, all right, this is going to be it. You know, we corrected a little bit deeper. This is going to be it. And now we're going to go. Still didn't happen. We started to pull back but wasn't the real rollover. And uh, once we had this candle come in here to go higher, uh, and I was like, okay, this time of the day, you know, we're getting towards 1030 now, 1025. I know that that's when the 15 minute chart starts mattering more than the five minute chart. That's just a general rule. The 15 minute kind of starts to take over around 1030. But I also know that every single time we were remarking about this in the chat here, Every single time over the course of the last three, four weeks, whatever it's been now, that the market has started to look bearish, what has ended up happening is that there's been no downside follow through and we've ended up turning into a sideways grind for most of the rest of the day and then we roll over into the close. So I was excited here for continuation. I was excited here for continuation. And here I knew that we could get continuation again because the 15 minute is what starts to matter. But I honestly was losing my conviction a little bit in this area. Started looking at the 15 minute. So here's your 15 minute. You got the price correction to that equilibrium area. And then you get your shooting star candle into that equilibrium on a little bit of confirming volume. So I was like, okay, I saw that. And I was like, all right, well, that, I'm, I'm not, I, I didn't regain like my exuberance on the short side by any means. But I was like, all right, well, that's a good sign. That is what I'm looking for. So maybe we do end up peaking here. And I still didn't at this point think that we would end up rolling all the way over to 280. I felt that if the market was really going to die, it would have done it more aggressively earlier on in the day. Um, but that 15-minute chart ended up working perfectly. You know, I did call out this little 15-minute shooting star that came in. And I said, I really didn't have a ton of conviction behind it. But I was like, you know, you can definitely put some shorts on on this candle versus this high. Um and again, I didn't have a ton of conviction on it, but it ended up being perfect. Uh, worked out perfectly. 15-minute chart. You know, if you look at this 15-minute chart, instead of only looking at today more microscopically, if you look at it in conjunction with yesterday, it makes a lot more sense. Um, you know, we sold off hard the last 15 minutes of the day, last 20 minutes of the day yesterday. That had continuation on our opening candle, extended here inside five and up, sorry, inside 15 and up, back to equilibrium. That's where you get your pivot. That's where you get continuation. And then when we got all the way down to the support level, 
the market really battled here. The market really battled and tried to hold this support mul multiple times. You know, got down there, a little bit of extension, bounce, try to make a higher low and bounce, try to hold the area again and bounce, you know, multiple times here. And then this last time, this last time here, they probably screwed some people over. The, the folks that were, and, and again, that's bullish, by the way. If they screw over the bulls, that's bullish. How do they screw over the bulls? Well, anybody who was long and is like, all right, well, my uptrend's still intact. I'm staying long versus the higher low on the bigger picture. Or anyone who is a day trader and was like, all right, market's coming down to this bigger, important support area. I'm buying. And maybe, you're, you know, you're making money in this range or whatever. Um, you probably got pushed out here, right? Because it broke that pivot low on the daily. It really, you know, even broke 279. Like I said earlier, I was viewing support as kind of broadly the area between 279 and the 21 EMA. So like, it's like a $4 support zone is what I was looking at today. And we got really to the lower band of that and even broke that a little bit. So they shook people out. So, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, and, and why is that shakeout of support actually bullish? Because when you get longs out, it means that they're not selling for profit on the way up. If you get new shorts in, they're getting squeezed on the way up. So this kind of shakeout of the bigger picture support actually makes this bounce that we got into the close easier for the market to do. So we did get a little bit of a bounce into the close. Uh, you know, I guess we closed around 181.75 or so. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, you know, the the bears definitely a little pick up in volume today. The bears definitely won a battle for the first time in a while uh, between you know yesterday afternoon and today's price action. The question really is is if they're going to be able to kind of push deeper into enemy territory by really clearing the support and giving further follow through. Um, a mistake that I've been making recently up here more often is expecting immediate gratification on my trading. When the volatility really picked up in this whole area of, you know, March and at least the first half of April, uh, with that increased volatility, you can really get that immediate gratification, right? You see kind of what's supposed to happen and then it happens. In this tighter price action, it can be frustrating a little bit more difficult because you know you got to be patient. So that that kind of even goes back to what I was saying with some of my trades. You know, um, buying the Lab D today, buying that Sox ETF, which are you know bear ETFs. Uh, you know, needing to to trying to keep that level of greed, which requires patience to be able to get the move. Uh, but also trying to be aggressive enough to have a big enough of a position where it can kind of work out. So, you know, again, my focus for the bear side of the market has really been the SPXU. Interesting to note the increase in volume in this thing here today. Uh, all of my entries in this thing, I, I really put a heavier entry um, this morning pre-market and then spent the rest of the day. I didn't buy it again the rest of the day. The rest of the day was about, about booking profits. I did the exact same thing in this OxX. Um, socks S, uh, you know, here's my buy pre market. It happens to be the low of the day, but I actually did that pre market. And then all I did was sell one time. Um, you know, I sold 50% of my position here and I'm holding everything else. So I'm going to use two outs now. Some of it's going to be today's low, and some of it is going to be yesterday's low. My risk is covered on all of that. I'll make money in it no matter what, as long as it doesn't get past those outs. Um, and I want to hold to see if I can get the bigger move. Uh, you know, same thing with this lab D it took two entries pre-market book some, some profit in three or four spots kind of on the way up, covered all my risk on use today's low and yesterday's low is my out for going forward. And what I'm thinking bigger picture on my holds with those is, um, if the market can break the support level and I can get another $10 of downside on the spy, it's going to be really big return on those three times kind of leverage ETFs potentially. So uh, that's what I'm looking for. You know, it goes back to, you know, what I always try to preach on really looking to maximize reward, cover your risk when you feel like, you know, the, the probability is on your side, cover your risk, put yourself in the position as best as possible to make sure that you're going to make at least some money no matter what. 
And then in certain scenarios, when I think the risk, risk reward and probability is there, you know, look for a bigger home run. I don't know, you know, specifically what price this Sox, Sox S will be at. It's almost hard for me to say that if the market goes to 270, but I would assume that it's at least a move to like $13 or so, uh, which is, you know, significant reward potential for the open risk I have, right? So the open risk, it's a 963 or whatever. You know, I give some back potentially 70 cents. I give some back, you know, this is a little bit more significant, um, you know, uh, whatever that is, a uh, dollar ninety, if my math is right, um, to potentially see if I can get another three, four dollars on at least on the upside on this. And then even at that point, you know, I kind of create these targets for myself. This is what I do. So, you know, what's the risk reward and probability of success? Do I feel like that's starting to be on my side? Try to put myself in the scenario where um, my risk is covered and worst case scenario is going to mean that I make no money or I make some money. That's kind of where I am now with these things. Again, there could be gaps. That's the danger of overnight risk. I could uh, have a huge gap against me where I do end up actually losing money in it. But for the most part, I feel like my worst case scenario is that I end up making some money in this at this point. And I'm willing to be able to give back a lot of open profit because if I can get a move to that initial target, what I'll do there is I'll probably take off then another half of my position and reassess the scenario. So my target and take off another half of my position, it'd be a huge profitable trade for me and then reassess. Should I take everything off? Do I think I can get even further downside, you know, and then, you know, entirely taking my cues from the market. That's why I spend so much time very specifically focused on what is the SPY doing? What is the queue doing? Even a lot of times when I'm typing up stocks intraday and providing commentary on it or whatever, um, the reason I'm typing up those stocks is because I, I want to, like, I'm not actively trading Apple right now necessarily, uh, but I need to pay attention to Apple. Like Amazon, I never trade actively, but, you know, I'm typing it up at points today. Um, you know, seeing this shooting star come in and seeing this little shooting star coming in and be like, okay, like, this is interesting. Are we going to get this pull in? And then all of that happened was basically a, a, like a little, a little miniature five minute bull flag here at ADMA caught up and gave another leg. Um, but I'm paying attention to these as proxies for the market because they're such a huge, important piece of the market and everything I'm doing is based on the market. So we'll see what happens. Uh, cues still look really healthy to me. To be honest, um, spies do not look as healthy. And you still have this leader laggard situation where it's so much easier to be short a bank than it is to be short of Apple. Uh, you know, I got a feeling that guys, even though this Apple ended up being weak today, were pulling their hair out trying to be short Apple in this initial up move. But if, you know, you type up any of these banks, so I live as JP Morgan, short, and, short anytime yesterday, short anytime today, and go for a walk. You know, uh, JP Morgan's down 3% on the day. Um, uh, you know, any, any of these real laggards, you know, really, you know, and this is some of the stuff that we we're talking about in the morning meeting. So maybe some of you guys caught these names as shorts, which would be great too. You know, JP Morgan down. Uh, American Airlines starting to break support. We were talking about that one. American Airlines down 5% on the day. You know, so much easier to short American Airlines than to short Apple. Um, but everyone wants to short Apple and, and, and those more difficult names to be able to do it. This is where, you know, and there's a place for that, right? We got some good shorts and some of the leaders on a couple one-off days, but generally you want to be, you know, if the market starts hitting my downside targets on the spy, as an example, start getting down closer to this 270, that's when I'm going to be looking to come in and buy AMD, Apple, Microsoft, Alibaba, you know, that, that's when I want to buy those leaders because that's that's where the, the money is going to go, right? You want to be long the leaders in the right circumstances. I'm not saying like, I just haven't been doing anything with them at all because I don't want to be chasing Apple up here, even though it is the leader, that's where you want to go long. But I'm not, I don't want to be shorting the leader because that's hard money. You shorten like any of these names I'm going on. I mean, this GE through support today, I know it's super weak at this point, but GE through six bucks, this thing got obliterated before it, it finally bounced. Um, 
So, you know, so, so much easier to be shorting an airline, a bank, uh, an industrial name than to short an Apple or an Amazon today, even if you did time Apple perfectly yesterday and today, it would have made you money. Um, but again, what, what I really want is to be buying AMD below 50. What I really want is for these spies to actually give a real correction where I can start to leg back into leading names and assess further on what I want to do as far as my shorts go and I'm just in the money. Those are those are the great scenarios to be in, right? <clears throat> Spy gets to 270. It's like, all right, what do I want to do? How much profit do I want to book? Those are great scenarios. Obviously, it's all about position building and everything to get yourself in those scenarios to begin with. So um, we'll see, you know, definitely excited about this little day and a half down move, but, um, uh, and I feel like we did a great job today, by the way, kind of calling this out. I feel like this would be one of the days where, well, this is one of the days where I miss being on the trading floor because I feel like we would have a, a couple good high fives on the desk because um, we we're all over this today. But as far as the bigger picture goes, even though I've got these short positions on, even though I am looking for this move to 270 to that next level of support, uh, the technicals are really not fully confirming that yet. So I don't want to get overly excited. I don't want to be stupid. I don't want to move away from my game planning, right? Game planning is a key. That's why I'm still, you know, I'm still booking profit in all of these shorts when they get to these areas because maybe spies don't get down to 270. Maybe, yeah, exactly. Maybe they, you know, end up holding around here as a support level and uh, I caught a great, you know, day and a half move and I, I was able to make some money for myself and I end up giving back some open profits and some things and, it kind of is what it is, and I'll still end up making some money for myself. You know, you built, you can hammer out a living for yourself, but the living I'm looking for is the one where the big money comes in because I'm actually fully right on the ideas and I'm loaded up properly. Um, so I think that's all I got for today. Uh, anybody have anything that they want me to go over? Oh, Uber was the other one that I that I that I shorted today, but then. And that news kind of came out. I was shorting up at 33 pre market. You know, just all covers on the way down. Reshorted a little bit when I called that out, kind of versus a little pivot that came in, got a short. Then I don't really know, Grub News or something, ripped it all the way back up to that 33. So I took another short, booked some profit again. But this thing, I, I kept um, maybe a third or less than a third of what my original short was overnight just because it really did not close well uh, at all. But I want to stick with my game plan. So that's it. Um, questions? Anybody have any names they want me to go over? General questions? Ha happy to spend some time answering. Sure, I can take a look at IWM. I don't know why I don't trade IWM. I like I've never really traded the Russell ETF in my entire career. It's probably a pretty good trading vehicle, especially it's tended to be relatively weak for the last year plus at this point. Um, so. Yeah, it seems exactly. It seems to be like it's better for shorts because it's always relatively weak. And, you know, it's all, I mean, what did the IW, IWM was down three and a quarter percent? It's a lot of banks, smaller banks, I think, are composed of the IWM. And we know banks got slaughtered today. Um, so I don't have as good of a feel on this. But look at this. It, it, I mean, this little break of highs here is tricky. But this thing didn't give anywhere near the bounce that spies and, and, and let alone cues gave. Uh, off of this hammer that came in, right? So overall, it's similar, right? They sold this thing off. They gapped this down even further because of the relative weakness. First candle here, uh, momentum to the downside. Second candle, five-minute hammer. What does this hammer mean? Price correction, price correction to where? She's somewhere between the 8 and 21 EMA. So it bounced back to that 8 EMA. This is kind of one of those spots where I guess I was getting faked out a little bit on the spies and the 15-minute chart became more important. So they, this little push through on highs is tough for anybody who is just, you know, I would like the idea today, especially of putting on a momentum short off the open and something that's relatively weak like this and just using the opening high as you're out and you would have gotten pushed out. You would have gotten a big enough move. This is why, by the way, look, shakeout, shakeouts happen and everyone should be prepared for that. It's always frustrating when, it's, when it happens and it always, you know, the way our psychology works, it always feels like. It means that you did something wrong and you tend to really focus on that latest shakeout. But in the long run, the most important thing is to stick to your rules. So if your trade was shorting off the open, 
if you had a good game plan, you definitely should have been able to cover your risk into this down move. And then when you got shaken out, you're not losing any money on it. Uh, you know, worst case scenario, it should be a break even trade, but it still would be super frustrating. I can literally envision myself having a green buy dot right here at this high uh, as I'm getting, you know, stopped out um, uh, of my short right before the rest of the continuation happens. So that would be super frustrating. But again, most important thing is to follow your rules. You can see the relative weakness here. Couldn't even bounce as much, but the 15 minute chart was still important. So when I'm when I type up the 15 minute chart right now, you're gonna see that this little five minute shooting star came in probably right into or right in front of the ADMA on the 15 minute chart. So let's take a look. Yeah, that little candle happens right into the ADMA on the 15 minute chart. And this actually is really a bear flag on the 15 minute, right? So this is really your flag pull, even though there's gap in the pull, your pull is last few days and into this morning's first bar, followed by a little bear flag. The ADMA, you know, when do bear flags tend to provide continuation is once the ADMA catches up to the base of the flag. That's exactly what happens here. And the follow through, the technical follow through is, is double the flag pull. So, you know, roughly 129.40 to, wow, 129.40, is that what I just said? Yeah, 129.40 to 124, let's just call it five bucks. Uh, so you would, it, you'd be looking for a move down to 119, low of the day is 120-ish, 120, 120 and change. So don't really fully fulfill that move. But again, you got to take all that stuff with a grain of salt, right? Like this is what like a technical analysis textbook would tell you. It's double the flagpole. But in my opinion, a technical analysis textbook is an oxymoron. Um, you know, it, it's not, you don't just memorize chart patterns and have everything work perfectly and, you know, have your bid at exactly 119 because that is the technical follow through of the bear flag. It's, a, it's like a load of crap. Uh, you got to pay attention to all the other factors that are affecting the market all at once. So all the same, you know, nice follow through on that bear flag and then, you know, spend the rest of the day resting. <clears throat> the price extension is from the top of the flag range, not the bottom. Okay, there you go. From the top of the flag range. So here to here. So that would play out perfectly. Okay, cool. Um, what else? What else, guys? Anybody have anything else they want me to take a look at? Can you explain how do I trade the SPXU intraday? Um, getting better at trading these inverses, but I'm missing huge entries. I literally saw the 1040 AM. 1040 AM. Uh Inside five, okay, that's this candle. Um, in SPXU and VXX, but didn't pull the trigger. Uh, even though the inside five strategy is my go-to play on each trade. Okay, so uh, first thing I would say about inside bars, just to, I guess, review. Inside bar strategy is an execution strategy. It means that you are, you're, it's like almost like you're looking for an excuse to be able to get into the trade. And sometimes pivots are formed by inside bars, right? Meaning like this pivot right here. So sometimes a pivot is formed like, I'm sure everyone could envision a hammer candlestick in instead. If you combine these two candles, it would just look like a hammer right here, right? So sometimes what you get is, you know, this bar, which can almost sometimes even close at lows, followed by an inside bar and up. And that is how you're kind of forming the pivot there. So you know, generally, when do I care about inside bars? I care about inside bars only based on what's happening around it. You can, if you tried to purchase or short every inside five or every inside 15 that you find on every chart and just, you know, whichever way it breaks, you take that as a trade, I promise you will lose money in the long run. It's not going to work. But you can use it in certain scenarios as an execution strategy if there are other things that you like. So um, I trade the SPXU staring at the SPY. I'm really trading the SPY and executing. I, I like how, first of all, I, I generally like trading things that are cheaper. Um, I like how I can really build into tier size and work that tier size. 
uh, you know, spies are, ex are, ex are expensive, but here I can be buying multiple thousand share lots at a time instead of buying, instead of shorting, you know, a couple hundred share lots. And that just um, provides much more game planning opportunity. There's so much more that you can do from a game planning perspective with a thousand shares than you can with 200 shares. So um, that's kind of why I like I like cheaper things that can move. So that's why I've been going to some of these three times ETFs because it's a cheaper thing that, that it can move. Um, but with that said, I, there's some other things I don't like. You know, you got to be careful about these things and, you know, the potential of price decay and or time decay and, and kind of things like that when you're dealing with those on a little bit of a, of a larger time horizon. Um, but they can be good instruments for, I think, you know, day and swing trades when you get kind of follow through. So um, the first thing I would say, again, if you're asking me how I trade SPXU, and I really don't like the VIX right now. I'm staying away from that. Um, thanks, Brent. Uh, I trade the SPXU based on spies. So uh, my idea this morning was um, I want some spies kind of honestly still versus yesterday's high. So I bought very, very small SPXU. Really, all I did was I, I ended up selling some SPXU after the close yesterday because it went as high as like 1640 after hours. So I, I sold more SPXU, and first I just kind of rebought that. And then I was watching it further. It kind of put in a pre-market low of, I think, 1561. I said, okay, I, I'm really thinking that this market, I'm, I'm aggressive today. I'm thinking that this market can give some real follow-through. Uh, so let me put on an, an additional trade for the day and I'm just going to, um, I'm looking for momentum. So I'm buying it right now, pre-market and it doesn't have to be pre-market. Um, but, uh, I, again, want to take advantage of that gap up and everything. It doesn't have to be pre-market, but that's what I did as a trade versus the pre-market low, which I believe was 16, 1561. So I bought, I think uh, this green, this other green dot here is that is that buy. I bought like 1578 or so uh, versus 1561. So I had whatever that is, 18 cents worth of risk, something like that. Um, and then it worked out, right? So uh, I'm just booking profit based on a game plan that I already have. And what's confusing now about if you're just looking at my dots is some of these dots are dots that are part of my, so I've talked about this in the past. When I take a day trade in something that I already have a position in, they may as well be two different trades in the same stock. So some of these red dots that you're seeing are me selling my bigger picture position that I've had for a while based on that game plan. And some of these dots that you see in here are uh, based on just my taking this day trade. So, you know, one of these sales here, I don't know which one, is basically a one-to-one -one kick. So I think I bought... I don't remember, and I'm probably I, I'm not really. I don't think I'm really supposed to talk about my exact numbers, but I think I bought four thousand shares or so as that day trade versus that pre market low. So somewhere in here is probably a, a two thousand share sell, and that leaves me with an additional two thousand shares of kind of an add on. So uh, I think I probably got another kick on that maybe here, and then maybe one of those kicks is me taking some extra off, and then some of these other kicks are are, are based on. Um, the bigger picture trade. And now the idea was that if it closes well, I'm going to have a second core. So now I have a second heavier core. So now separately I have a spreadsheet. So in that spreadsheet right now, basically what it says is you have X amount of shares with an out that I'm going to now use today's low as that out. So I think today's low is 1573, which is nice because it's you know, only five cents away from that buy price. So that extra new core is going to have it out at 1573, and my original core um, has a has a stop of whatever this absolute low is, 1464, I guess, uh, is what my spreadsheet is going to say. Um, so you know, I got to be able to track all these different trades at the same time. So to answer your question, I mean that's how I traded it. I didn't take any of the trades here. I like this idea though of this inside five. But why do I like the idea of this inside five? I'll tell you the reason I like it is because of the 15 minute chart of the spies. You know, basically, 
if I took this trade here with what you're looking at, I'm not only buying it just because there's an inside five that breaks up. It's not enough for me. I'm taking this as an inside five that breaks up because of this 15 minute shooting star on the spies. If this doesn't exist, I'm not taking this. But because this exists, that means that I can use this as an execution strategy and then have good probability on my side. And then this becomes a strong risk reward as well. Because, you know, you could come in and buy 1587 here and use your out as either the low of that bar or I probably would use the low of the previous bar, 1572. So you're taking 15 cents risk in a three times ETF based on really this 15 minute hammer is your bigger a shooting star is your bigger picture thing. That's kind of the other piece of the puzzle that's putting the probability on your side. So again, I, for me, it's more about focusing on that risk and making sure that the reward potential is there. How do I know that the reward potential is there? Now I got to go to an even bigger picture, right? My bigger picture on the spies, this, I think I can go to 280 in the spies, 270 in the spies. So if I'm short, you know, if I'm executing a, this three times ETF while my spies are at 286, I could get $6 of downside to my first target and $16 of downside to my second target on 15 cents risk in a three times leverage ETF. So the bottom line with understanding these inside fives or whatever, you can't just trade them all. If you trade them all, you're going to lose money. You got to always, and this is what I'm always trying to do with my trading is look at the multiple pictures at the same time and see you know what levels of probability I have on my side as far as execution goes to, to be able to make money and put myself in a position where I have a good risk reward. And worse that happens is um, this just fails. I lose my 15 cents. Best that happens is spies go to 270. If spies go to 270, I don't know, where does that mean the SPXU is? It was down there April 21st, and this is not going to be exact by any means, but the April 21st high is like $19. Um, so, you know, maybe I'm coming in here and I'm buying at, you know, $15.85 for $0.15 cents risk, and I can get a move up to, what did I just say, $19? I can get, you know, $4 of upside or whatever. That's a phenomenal risk reward. Right. Like that's how I want to be thinking on the trades that I'm executing. You know, sure. Sometimes I'll take a little bit of a scalp, whatever. You know, I look at like we did in whatever Friday that was, like a week ago Friday in Guild, where I think me and Felipe just had a little bit of fun, made some cash flow, like scalping some some guild or whatever it is. But for the for the most part, look, the big money's in the big moves. Uh, that that's what it comes down to. Big money is in capturing big moves. Big, big money is in capturing big moves with big size. So that's what I want to be able to do whenever I'm trading. How, how can I put myself in the position to make the big move? Uh, what is generally the shortest time frame that you execute a five-minute chart? Um, I don't look at any – I really I, – I have access to a two-minute chart. I don't even have access to a one-minute chart. Uh, I almost never look at this two-minute chart. I almost never, I, I really don't have any interest in looking at anything less than five minutes. The time frame is just too small. I think the charts, the time frame is too easily manipulated. There's too many false signals on those very small time frames. So, you know, everything starts from the big picture, like I was just kind of explaining, and then five and 15 minute charts can can be used more for, for execution. You know, what I just described here is utilizing a five minute chart to try to be able to capture daily reward. Now, what's the probability? when you're actually purchasing this stock right here at 18 at 15.85 what's the probability that you get stopped out versus what's the probability that you catch a move to twenty dollars in this thing because spies go to 270 probability is much higher that you're going to get stopped out that's why by the way i always like to cover my risk because it's a very good probability if i have good execution skills i can get that one-to-one -one kick Plus a little extra, you know, again, like what I did with my buy, got my one-to-one -one kick, booked a little extra. I'm going to make some money in it no matter what, as long as it doesn't gap past my out. And now uh, maybe, you know, it's a smaller percentage of the time. I don't know what the percentage is. Maybe it's one in 50. I don't know. 
where I don't get stopped out of the remaining position and I capture a massive move. But if one in 50, <laughs> that's, that's good, honestly, because if the other 49 times are me being break even, you know, losing a small amount of money, making a small amount of money, and then that one in 49 times is a trade that makes me tens of thousands of dollars, I'm making money, making good money, or even maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how big of a trader you are. Um, yeah, so sure. Anything else, guys? Okay, cool. Um, great job today, guys. Really good communication out there. We'll see how this market goes. We'll pick it up tomorrow. We'll assess the news, the gap. If you'd like to learn more about prop trading, click the link in the video description.